turn off Raul when I hit it. <laughs> so it's just part. Uh, I guess I know it's a very odd thing. <laughs> I can't tell. Oh yeah, my mic is on now. All right. Um, so for chair business, we're going to briefly discuss strategic planning process. <laughs> a brief discussion of the family survey because we did not do that and sort of the key items that everybody was supposed to do their homework I did send a reminder we'll do a brief discussion of the ED evaluation um, and then uh, we will have a discussion on culture philanthropy at AMSA uh, and ed committee update no finance committee update so that's our agenda for the evening are there any additions or changes or requests to moving that around Okay, so I have to start off with some very sad news, um, which is I have tried to keep this from happening, but Allison Cohen has resigned from the board, and it is truly just because she is completely swamped at work. She's completely swamped, and you know that she's had to miss the last couple of board meetings for a number of different reasons, and I've, and we've, I've tried to figure out over the last six months, I would say, if there was a way that I could make it manageable for her. Um, but she feels that she just cannot. She leaves on very good terms. Obviously, she's thrilled. She says, you know, she's accomplished what she wanted to do when she joined the board, so she's really happy about that. She didn't leave us an alert. She waited until Jill was on the board. <laughs> so we actually have some legal coverage, and Jill has been getting involved in some of the facilities thing. Um, and she's thrilled that Dr. Lewis is at the helm. So that, you know, is all part of feeling that the the school is in a in a really good direction and on a good trajectory and because of that she just you know she owns her own law firm and so no one else can you know she can't delegate a lot of her work and it's, she's just so she sends her regards and that is very unfortunate so Rick and I have been talking about this and over the course of the next month we we will need to identify a new secretary um, to serve out the rest of her term so I'm looking at you sort of governance committee members <laughs> And we'll just, so anyone who's interested, please talk to me or Rick, uh, who can fulfill that role. Secretary of all the officers is very straightforward. You know, you look at the minutes. So, anyway, so just wanted everyone to know about that. So if you want to send a note to Allison, please feel free to. Okay. Um, so now we can look at the meeting minutes from the August meeting. So far in advance, right? Like three days. <laughs> <laughs> so. Is all the, the packet in, in our board and track? Yeah. Is that not a folder I'm trying to Oh, why don't you have a folder? Oh, you can take it from the folder. There are folders around. <laughs> you can take Allison's folder. I apologize. No, nope, it's on the wrong side. Oh. Or is it on the wrong side or is it? It could be on the wrong side. Oh, okay. No. No, they're all just the same thing.
schedules and student loans and all that. Um, overall, teachers across all grade levels and departments reported feeling like everything has been much better than last year. Um, many teachers have remarked that people seem happier overall and that there is more of even just a fun vibe amongst the teachers as well. Um, one teacher said that it's been better than the start of any school year I have ever experienced anywhere, ever. Um, very smooth, very organized, and optimistic. I hope to teach at AMSA forever, for real. Uh, in response to that comment, another teacher remarked that to think that anyone could think this after what we have been through literally brings tears to my eyes. The reason for these feelings is an overall feeling of optimism for the future. The start to this school year is generally regarded to be much smoother than last year. Teachers had their schedules in advance, and orientation provided time for the administration to communicate new policies and visions for the year. Additionally, class sizes are typically better, and most people's schedules are vastly improved compared to last year in regards to room changes during the day. However, some classes are still a little on the larger side, um, with a handful between 27 and 30 students, and this is particularly true in the foreign language department. Um, it should be noted, however, that department chairs, guidance counselors, and the scheduling avengers um, did try to avoid classes of this size, and it really was a last resort. Um, and teachers typically have classes somewhere between 20 and 25, and there's even several classes that are under 20 students. Um, guidance counselors reported not having to change as many student schedules this year um, compared to years past as well, which is a good sign. Teachers expressed excitement over some possible new opportunities for teachers as well this year, including international travel and course offerings. Um, we have three trips that are running this year that a lot of teachers are involved in planning and recruitment for. Um, and in total, there are almost 100 students that are enrolled in those trips, which is wonderful for them. Um, it provides a wonderful opportunity for teachers as well as they get to interact with students in a different way. Um, and teachers who lead trips do have the opportunity to engage in tremendous professional development by going um, to going to Europe and doing training tours that are related to these um, trips. Uh, there's also a couple courses that are being co-taught by two teachers this year. So one of these is a blend um, of discrete math and computer science that um, Mr. Azarito and Ms. Bandaro are doing. And then the other one is a blend of web design and art that Mr. Alvarez and Mr. Morgan are doing. Um, so it's really exciting that we're trying to start offering these kinds of courses here because it's really something that's more um, at the heart of advancement in education. Just a handful of concerns to make note of. Um, there's a few facilities issues, it seems, in regards to the air conditioning, particularly with the unusually warm weather in the past few weeks. Um, and according to facilities, the landlord hasn't been very responsive in addressing those concerns. Um, there's also a massive restructuring of the seventh grade course schedules that caused a little bit of confusion among the seventh grade teachers and students, but it was resolved within a few days. Parents' nights went well overall. Um, some teachers did express a desire to not schedule these on the same day that we have after school meetings, just because it makes for a long day. Um, and the most prevailing concern is the overall status of the building due to the four lease signs um, that are very prominently displayed. Um, and just teachers are anxious for updates on what's happening, and um, you know they're not really sure how to perceive the lack of information about it, um, just due to all the conditions surrounding that. Um, they're also looking forward to seeing how negotiations go for the new contract within the coming year, and teachers did meet, uh, members of the collective bargaining unit did meet this week to start discussing hopes that they have for that. A um, couple other little updates. Um, new teachers overall who I was able to reach out to um, are just so happy with AMSA. Um, one said, I'm new and everything is great. Another said, everyone's so helpful. Another one said that everyone or everything is great. And the days of the beginning of the year have been gold or were gold for them. Um, and then just another update for the lower school, since I shared some concerns from lower school teachers last month. Um, teachers in that part of the school did share that there is some feeling of adjustment in the lower school uh, with the department or departure rather of Ben Keeler. Um, as with any departure, there's a feeling of starting again with new procedures and expectations. But with that said, Lower school teachers are definitely appreciative of the visibility of one of our deans, Dan Amaral, and Mike Naraki, who's now <coughs> the assistant principal, um, just being very present in the lower school to really um, give a sense of just visibility and consistency that students are definitely picking up on as well. Um, some teachers did express a desire to see more administrative presence, particularly during passing time, um, and they're just a little cautious because it seems like the lower school is becoming Dan and Mike's domain, where the upper school might be James and Ellen's domain, and just wanting to make sure that students kind of see everyone and know that everyone is um, someone that they can turn to if they need something, and just someone who will hold them accountable. Um, but again, everything's great for the most part, so it's really nice. I feel spoiled to give a very positive update. So that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Does anyone have any questions for Brianna? like the one bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> it was hard. <laughs> <laughs> like everyone's like, it's great. So, which is good. I think we'll take it. Yeah. We'll take it. Yeah. yeah. yeah.
Jill, parent rep update. I likewise have a positive report. <laughs> um, I actually didn't really get any complaints um, between last meeting and this meeting. I did meet with a member of FAME, that's the um, Friends of Arts and Music Education. Um, they've been around since 2012 and they've been working with the administration with their their main goal is to um, get an instrumental music program um, added to the curriculum. Um, the, the member I met with wanted to make sure that I mentioned that they're very happy now. They Between 2012 and maybe up through last year, there have been ups and flows as far as their um, relationship with the administration, but um, they've been heard. Um, they're very happy with meeting with Ms. Uh, Lindsay um, over the past year plus, and there is a proposal on the plate right now. So Fame's very happy about that, and it's good timing because I think Dr. Lewis will be talking a little bit about the music proposal. Um, and then the only other concern they have is that whatever facilities decisions are made in the future, they want to make sure that um, band is included in that consideration. Um, and again, they want to make sure they know that they're, they feel supported now. They're, they feel like you know the light is at the end of the tunnel here. They do see the progress that's been made. So um, and yeah, they're a very good group, very good group of parents. So that's all I have. Making the timekeeper very happy too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're one minute ahead of schedule. Okay. So we started late. <laughs> All right. Even though we started late, look at that. All right. Um, mm -hmm. Rick is being timekeeper. Yes. Um, so we will turn to the EDs report. Okay. Thank you. So I'm I'm gonna time myself. <laughs> make sure I I don't go over 15 minutes. So uh, uh, another long link, lengthy report. I'll try not to be terribly boring. Uh, so I just want to thank everybody who helped out for. Uh, uh, the parents' nights that we had, uh, and definitely noted, Ms. Murphy, what you said about uh, scheduling parent night on the, when we have uh, meetings after school as well. Uh, it's been really, really busy uh, this whole September, um, uh, doing one, one thing after the other. Uh, and tomorrow is going to be very exciting. Uh, we have two things going on tomorrow. We have a community uh, community meeting with all of our students, uh, Ms. Lindsay and Mr. Naraki, Mr. Amaral, and, and Mr. James um, have been very instrumental in getting together these community meetings um, uh, whose goal is to build respect and community amongst the uh, staff and students as well. Uh, we also have professional development after school uh, with the consultant hired by uh, the BOT, Board of Trustees, Cheryl Lower, um, and that's going to be focused on building some consensus around mission and purpose, um, improving our school today, and improving our school five years from now. Um, and then next week on Tuesday, we have <coughs> we have uh, the first family forum. The family forum used to be called the Ed Coffee. Um, so we just changed the name a little bit. Um, really, really important. Ms. Lindsay, I'm really excited about those. It's a, a real great opportunity to get feedback from parents and to hear what their concerns are, what their ideas are, uh, what's working and what's not working. So we're really excited about that. And we're really, really excited about everything that Mr. Finkel does. Uh, Mr. Finkel just rocks. Um, just one viral video after another viral video. And if, if you haven't seen his videos, uh, I mean, he's pumping them out all the time. Uh, M. Finkel Productions. Uh, just, uh, I Dream a Dream. If you haven't seen I Dream a Dream, uh, terrific video, star starring uh, Alex Waldron, and he's also had he's he's made some videos of teachers in action. Uh, he had a great video of Miss Bowman uh, teaching uh, AP Macro. Uh, the on the website. Yep, yep, the Facebook page. Facebook. <coughs> uh, really terrific job. So we've been really busy, and we've been focused on lots of details here and there. But I also think it's important to remind ourselves, remind myself. Uh, what are some of our core fundamental goals, and to never lose sight of that, even when we're amidst all the weeds uh, and the, the hurly burly. Uh, and the, the two goals, and I, I know I say this every month, and I'll, I'll continue to say it: uh, fostering a high sense of spirit amongst our students, staff, and parent and parents, and doing so via the creation of a robust 
democratic culture uh, in our school where everybody's voice is heard. Um, and never losing sight of the foundational purpose of our school. And that foundational purpose is that all students, regardless of background, regardless of ability, can excel in all subjects. And we will fight tooth and nail for each and every child that comes through our doors. Um, these are our goals. These are our shining stars, the light that guides us and gives us direction amidst the day-to-day -day hurly -burly. Um So uh, five updates uh, that I have. So first, uh, MCAS results. So at last month's uh, BOT meeting, <coughs> we looked at the uh, AP scores. Uh, the scores were strong. They reflected, I think, a sense of commitment on the part of teachers um, and definitely the hard work on the part of our students. Uh, I think our spring 2017 MCAS scores uh, for our high school students were equally uh, very, very impressive. Uh, second update, so we've uh, done a lot of work on observations um, and uh, evaluation forms. Um, so one of our <coughs> core goals this year, as we have stated, is spirit and excellence. And we believe, Ms. Lindsay and I believe, it's really fundamental to retain and support our teachers and help them grow and to thrive. Um, and so to help accomplish this goal of retaining our teachers, growing our teachers, um, we were fortunate enough to have a group of teachers and department heads create a new observation form, uh, which we have previously discussed, uh, the purpose of which is to help our teachers grow within a very supportive uh, environment. Uh, the form is a tool uh, that we hope can uh, lead to uplifting and very supportive conversations. I had one today, it went very well. Um, and to help everybody use it, to help our teachers use it, to help our administrators use it, we're using an online platform called uh, TeachPoint, which we used many years ago and then it was kind of dropped and now we're picking it up. Uh, it enables, as you can see, the administrators to write, upload, and send their observations to teachers and counselors who can then review and respond to the observations um, and also establish times for meetings. Um, so to work well, our new observation evaluation <coughs> uh, system also needs to be calibrated. Um, uh, up according to the uh, uh, agreement we've, re we've reached with the uh, union, potentially 50% of all observations will be done by administrators outside of a teacher's immediate department. So all department heads are responsible for at least one evaluation within the department and then at least one evaluation will be given outside of the department. So we really, really want to make sure that when administrators are going in the classrooms, we kind of have some agreement on what some of the fundamentals and basics are of good teaching. So to do that, we are beginning very, very, very soon. Uh, we are sponsoring a series of learning walks where uh, department chairs, administrators will jointly in small groups uh, attend classrooms. And then after we attend classrooms, we will sit down together and say, well, what did you see? What did you see? What did you see? And we'll use the form so that we can not come to complete agreement on what constitutes good teaching because that's impossible um, and should never happen in the first place because there's lots of variety of good teaching. But just to kind of establish a common understanding of what are some of the things that do constitute good teaching. A clear goal, a structure to the lesson, a supportive classroom environment. Uh, so we're really looking forward to that. Uh, another update, update number three, uh, moving right along. Uh, this concern, update number three is about enrollment, concerns the registrar's office and student uh, enrollment. So major stumble that we had at the start of the year and one that I take 100% responsibility for is our uh, enrollment uh, process. And uh, Ms. Murphy alluded to one consequence of that. There are two negative consequences of that which I take responsibility for. One is that we are over-enrolled. Uh, we currently have 992 students, 26 over our cap. Uh, and as a result of uh, the mistakes uh, that I made, we had to reconfigure our grade seven schedule, uh, which was very, uh, it was difficult for the kids, it was difficult for the teachers. Uh, but the good news is that we have a fantastic team. Uh, Ellen Lindsay, Sarah Snow, our director of accountability, and Linda Edwards, who's sitting right over there, our fantastic new registrar, are already working on turning those mistakes into really fantastic opportunities. And they have just been burning on all cylinders to do that. Uh, so just a couple things that they've done. We've met with the Department of Education 
been very open, honest about our concerns uh, and asking them for guidance, and they've been tremendously helpful. Uh, we've also hired uh, Ms. Edwards, our new registrar, who has tons and tons of research experience uh, and also experience uh, at AMPS as a teacher and a parent. And just as important, we're, we're creating a, a new vision of the <coughs> registrar's office, and, and this new vision um, <coughs> is of a registrar's office that is open, that is transparent, and that really, really functions uh, with all our other, other departments. The registrar's office is so important. It affects busing, it affects our schedule, it affects our special education department. Um, it is so important, and that ability to communicate clearly and openly and quickly is very important for all the wheels to turn. So the goal is to get this, get our registrar's office into that open, transparent place where it's constantly communicating. I know Ms. Edwards shares that, and, and we all share that. So um, it's we've in the short term, it's been a difficult process and it's been troubling, but I am 100% confident long term this will be a absolutely beneficial uh, for our students and for our school uh, and you can judge us eight months from now and see if that's true. Dr. Dr. So thank you that's a great update on that I love the fixes. Uh, what are the implications on the budget if we're over enrolled? Uh, well we we don't receive money for so any of the okay. students okay. so that's those are all students we don't receive money for. Okay, that's so it's, it's, an, it's a negative Yep, financial no, yep. okay. so uh, I have further questions since Mike's opened it up um, so the the students are they spread across many grades or are they in mostly seventh grade is that what yes the mostly disruption? mostly in seventh grade yes mostly as in the 26 that are over are half of them are in seventh grade uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't have the exact numbers I wasn't um, looking for exact I was looking for sort of rough word Certainly, they're, they're more in seventh grade. There are some in sixth grade, or some in ninth grade, eighth grade. So it essentially means that there's one more class. It sounds like there's one more class of seventh graders. The, the class classes have remained the same. It's just the size of the classes have increased. So um, you, it, uh, my second question is, and you, you sort of intimated this. So um, um, among sort of these extras, has there been an impact on uh, other support programs such as uh, regional busing or special education? It's, busing has been very difficult the past few weeks and that certainly doesn't help busing at all. Yeah, so our buses, I, I was are, speaking, our I was, buses are, are packed and working close. In fact, I have a meeting on Monday with the business manager at Marlboro Public Schools. Our buses have been packed. Our parents are upset about the pickup times, the overcrowded buses. Kids are being a few kids are being kicked off buses. There were four kids who had to leave a bus this morning. Um, so it, it 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 doesn't help. It doesn't help the budget. Doesn't help the schedule. Doesn't no, help the buses. So uh, you can go on. You can go on down the line how it doesn't help. So the Marlboro buses are are overcrowded. How about the regional buses? What's it been the impact on regional buses? Uh, I, I don't know. I think that it's our main concern the past, well, there's one regional bus. Our main concern has been the eight Marlboro buses. No, I understand that. But I, I heard from a parent, uh, in fact, two parents who uh, were accepted in and then found out that they there wasn't space on the regional buses. And so I was just wondering to what extent that was an issue or a uh, problem. I can't speak directly to the regional bus, but I can certainly tell you that the buses have been a, a difficult issue. So you said I, that I'm just you, giving a two-minute warning in terms of time. <laughs> so you said that uh, you'd ask the uh, um, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education for guidance. Yes. And so what, what was their guidance in terms of option? Uh, well, there you look. You, the new enrollment policy that you're looking at is a lot of the guidance that they have offered to us, helping us clean up our enrollment policy and helping us clean up our enrollment application uh, and 
giving us advice on how, what options we have for dealing with over enrollment? So the enrollment application, excuse me, the enrollment policy was the cause of this? The enrollment policy? Well, you, you said that. Um, no, I, that you, enrollment you, policy you was that, not that the cause. giving you no, guidance yeah. on no, this I, enrollment it, it, policy, it, and that w had come out of this. I instead. wouldn't say the enrollment policy was the cause of it. I would just say it was my inability, my lack of knowledge, inability to ask good questions, um, lack of understanding for how the uh, registrar's office worked. The arrows point to me. Thank you. All right. It's probably over time. You'll go. You, you, can, you can go. You can go. <laughs> okay, excellent. So, uh, so two, two more updates. So the fourth update is uh, the schedule uh, for next year. Uh, so the scheduling Avengers have put together a very aggressive timeline that has been reviewed by department chairs and will hopefully uh, make next year's schedule go even smoother uh, than this year's uh, schedule. Uh, it was because of the scheduling Avengers that our schedule this year was much better, and I have no doubt that it will be also because of the Avengers that next year's schedule and our highly functioning registrar's office that next year's schedule will be even better uh, as, as well. So the first major step in that process, first major goal that we have for ourselves is to make sure that we have a course catalog published on our website by December 1st, <coughs> and then students and parents will have two months uh, to select courses, uh, and, which is significantly uh, better than last year. Last year we published our course catalog the day before February vacation. So what this will do, uh, will, it will give students uh, a significant amount of time to talk with parents. It will give them a lot of time to talk to uh, guidance counselors and teachers about their options. Uh, it will also provide students two months to demonstrate their ability. So perhaps a student wishes to take an AP class, perhaps a student wishes to take an honors class, and a teacher can say, well, show me what you've got in two months. Uh, and then from a scheduling perspective, the two-month period should provide a much more uh, reliable course count. So uh, the last update about the AMSA music program, um, very, very happy to announce that Ms. Lindsay and the Parents of Fame have drafted a uh, three-year plan for creating a very robust music program at AMSA, and it will include uh, for next year a once-a-week uh, music class during directed study in the lower school, and hopefully by 2019-2020, a band class elective uh, in the high school. And the, uh, the eventual goal of the uh, program will be a band program that will offer two band classes uh, during the school day and a full after-school jazz band program. Thank you. Go Eagles! <laughs> Go Eagles! <laughs> Any other questions for Dr. Ewan? Oh, that's great. Okay, we should turn then to the enrollment policy um, that Sarah circulated for us earlier this afternoon um, in the enrollment form. Now the yellow, um, the yellow highlights are all the changes to what the current enrollment policy is, and much of this is new guidance, right? guidance from DEES. So this has been provisionally approved by DEES. Um, we need to look at it, discuss it, approve it, and then it goes to back to DEES to the Commissioner of Education for final approval which could take up to a week. So it actually means right now we're delaying in our open enrollment. It normally starts October 1st, and it's going to have to be delayed until mid-October. Are so. there any questions about any aspect of this? So these were changes made at these recommendational compliance. It's not all at these recommendations. I mean, some of these are also just clarifications. So I can to make it very explicit. Okay. Start pulling. Yeah. Sarah has provided me a checklist of some of the Point key changes. Just so, just so <laughs> if, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, so the four key changes that Sarah uh, has has told me that have been made. So one is that uh, there is one lottery per grade um, for for everybody. So there's one lottery per grade, uh, and then um, uh, that's one big change, uh, and uh, once the lottery is held, then the students or the, uh, the students will then be separated into essentially three buckets: the sibling status, uh, 
court town status, non court town status, but that we won lottery in each grade before. Uh, this year there were, I'm not sure how many lotteries, but there were separate lotteries. The lotteries were separated before the So that, that makes sense because if, if, if I, to the example, if I move from Clinton to, to, uh, to a, from core town to non-core town, right. if I wasn't part of the lottery, which is the way the old system was, then I wouldn't have a lottery place. In, 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 you know, I don't now that I've, I'm sorry? I don't understand. It's not a question. It was, a, it was just trying to clarify. This makes sense given the fact that before, if I was in a core town, yeah. Then I wouldn't even be in the lottery. That's the way it was before. They they just never put. You no, know, they, the, were still, they, they were still, still in the lottery. lottery. I understand, but it was a separate lottery, and so once once it, you went through that, yeah. then okay, I, I don't need to take up time. I, I guess I was just saying it makes sense to yes. to go to the one yes. lottery because they could change towns, but they're not going to change Correct. grades. Right. right. So. Yeah, Sarah did a terrific job explaining it to me. So yeah. there's one lottery in each grade, and then based upon that one lottery in each grade, you create these kind of three buckets or three tubes. You drain the sibling status tube first, you drain the core town status tube second, and then you drain the uh, outside non-core town status. Uh, so the language, that's one change. The other language change required by Dees was uh, language that addresses homeless students. Uh, language that provides more choices for proving residency and also uh, how getting rid of uh, gender assignments in the, in the uh, form, admissions form. So it'll just say parent one and, and parent two. Can I ask one question about the um, lottery that just uh, popped into my head? Um, When the lottery is done, do you first uh, drain sixth grade first and fill the sixth grade with what's available and then go to seventh, eighth, and ninth? Or? That would move the dollars before. Okay. Because that is the way you should be. You, you want to fill your sixth grade. First, you want to fill the sixth grade. Mm -hmm. But if you have 500 people applying for sixth grade, you're not filling 500 slots. Correct. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But if we only have, let's say, 150 slots available. Well, the thing about backfilling doesn't, because that's just filling an already, already assigned. So you're right, sixth grade is filled, deal, filled first. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. it, it's more complicated than that, but because basically the if, if somebody leaves the school was a seventh grader, yeah. we have to replace them with a seventh grader. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the right thing. So, so when we go through, go to fill, we'll have, we'll know we'll have X number of sixth grade slots, X number of seven, X number of eight, yeah. and X number of nines to fill when the when the uh, enrollment process starts. Register, and do do their magic to correctly fill those slots according to the student population and the rules. Is there uh, anything in this about um, placement on the wait list if one of the core towns has already reached its maximum? Yes, we need that task. Yeah. Yes, yes. That's in there. Yes. When will the filling take place? Like if the seventh grader leaves in November, will they be filled like the next week or whatever? Or do, is there? Just a note, we're seven minutes over on okay. this particular item. Well, this is cutting into my time, so <laughs> I'm choosing so my first seven minutes. Question, I don't know if it's a fair question. I don't want to imply or assume that the over-enrollment issue had anything to do with the policy.
policy, but do any of these changes are were done or expected to to reduce over enrollment? No. Actually, going to help the process, um, the end of because of the very. I'm sorry, you said there's no backfill in 10th or 12th through 12th grade. Yeah, you have to backfill for 6, 7, 8, and 9, but not for 10, 11, and 12. Have, have, you, we, have you, we backfilled before for 10th no, or 12th? Well, I no. Think no. Clarification, if, if a 10th, 11th, or 12th grader leaves, we do not have to replace them with a 10th, 11th, or 12th grader. Right. If we'll a 6th, 7th, or 8th grader right. or 9th grader leaves, grade. we, have to we have to backfill right. or replace with a student of that grade. That's so when someone grade. leaves in 10th grade, it effectively opens up another sixth grade slot in yeah. the next year. Okay, so let's say, let's say a, if you're not over enrolled. So let's say an eighth grader, an eighth grader leaves this year. Are we going to have to backfill them with an eighth grader? We won't. Yes. Back, even though we're over the cap. Yeah. Yes. The state punishes us for being successful. That's how it happened before when we were previously yeah. over-enrolled, too. That's why we had the bubble class. We had to wait for them all to graduate. They don't pay us for the students, and we have such high demand, and we're such a well, if there's quality school, and kids want to come here, and then, you know, if, if we're, we, we will not be reimbursed for those students who are very hopeful to getting to AMSA. Well, so in fairness, they're not punishing us because we're successful. They're punishing us because we ended up taking 26 kids more than we were supposed to. Any other questions on the enrollment policy admissions form? Um, if not, I will entertain a motion to approve. I'd like to make a motion to approve the. I second. That was Roger. I did. Liz. Okay, all in favor? And motion passes unanimously. All right, so let's move on to, and I'll make this strategic planning really short so make up time. Um, because Dr. Lewis already alluded to it. So if you recall, we talked about bringing Cheryl Lower in, and we agreed last time to have the first stage of this overall strategic plan be a really focused on internal um, with, with the school employees because that was, you know, we felt like 80% of the issues, if we got a handle on what those were, would really help to inform the broader uh, discussion when we go out to look for input. So. Cheryl and one of her colleagues, Kelly Trejo, who am I yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, with the administration's help, conducted sort of a first stage of interviews to sort of understand what the major <coughs> themes were. And then now they have designed a three and a half hour session tomorrow afternoon. They're using the PD day where all, every, all the teachers are available um, to do a small, you know, group, overall group discussion, and it's been very guided. I don't know if there's anything more. Did you take a look anymore? I think you covered it pretty well. Okay, I think that's really what it is. Um, Rick will be there tomorrow, so we'll have uh, a board member there. Um, and we're really looking forward to it. You know, so the smaller group, when, when after that day, they'll consolidate the information. We'll have some interesting meet to then actually design what the process would be to solicit broader <coughs> So that is the goal. So we're on our way. It's very exciting. To actually and is she engaged through the entire process or just this piece of just it? Just this piece of it. Because we don't know what the overall process <coughs> is and what it will be. So that's why we sort of agreed to take on this one little piece first. So then we can much more clearly design process with all those very clear outcomes and deliverables in each phase. So we'll have that proposal after this. <laughs> um, family survey. So, Rick, 
Yes, so I think everybody here had homework. Let's see how good you students are. <laughs> um, so as you'll recall, last time we reviewed the uh, faculty survey, folks had homework to, to, to try to look at what major issues or concerns or challenges or areas they wanted to focus on and discuss those. Um, similar sur uh, homework is today in terms of anything you wanted to highlight when reviewing the family survey. And so I have my own opinions and my own thoughts, but maybe we can open up the floor to folks who, uh, to share what, what they saw, wanted to highlight. Assuming folks did their homework, of course. So I know that you said that we could go straight to the website. When I went to the website, it gave me the same problem. And then so the it AMSA, asked me for a log. The AMSA. It asked so me you may want to clear cookies. I'm sorry? That's, you may want to clear cookies on your browser or the cookies associated with that. Do you know what that is, Ken? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> you just had to look like you didn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I just, you, you may have gone in before with a different password. It may have been just in your browser or whatever, but if you clear your cookies, did work because I, I, I had that problem and then I cleared my cookies and then it worked. <laughs> so. It worked for me this time. I don't know why, but you and I talked last time. It's not the work. So. <laughs> Your cookies cleared themselves. They did. By themselves. <laughs> suggest that when you do look at benchmarks in general on, on the site, and I'm sorry not bringing it up, but you, you, to your point, you can look at school level and to compare those benchmarks at the school level, that is elementary or middle school or high school, because especially for the faculty related surveys, uh, just because of engagement levels, natural engagement level attrition, I guess you could say, as kids advance grades across the board, the, these numbers start going down. So I think it is interesting, as you mentioned, that um, kind of one thing that I noticed was uh, under family engagement, and this question, I mean, do we, are we concerned with this? Um, you look at questions in the past year, how often have you helped out at your child's school, and how often do you meet in person with teachers at your child's school? Those numbers seem quite low, right? So how often do you meet in person with teachers at your child school, it's like 1% responded favorably. Um, yeah, but one might I, argue that, the, the, so it said things like, do you meet monthly, weekly? Yeah. And one might argue, well, I'm responding favorably because, you know. I'm not I'm required to meet. Like, yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't <laughs> that, that kind of, I had the same issue when I was going through those questions. It's like, as a parent, I'm thinking, okay, if I'm meeting with my students teachers my son's teachers on a weekly basis that could be indi uh, an indication something's wrong if Absolutely. i'm not then that could be an indication that things are very good yeah. and actually i shouldn't have spoken to the percentage but yeah. actually to the actual results so if you look in if you drill down you will notice that 40 percent say almost never mm -hmm. and the question is is that good or bad i don't know yeah do we want just kind of as a community mm -hmm. for parents to meet more frequently with teachers, regardless of yeah. whether things are good or bad. And I think that's just a question. <laughs> I think it'd be great to have much more involvement. Be teachers, administrators, just, uh, it doesn't need to be every week, but just more involvement, just a sense of ownership that uh, I 
it'd be great to, to figure out ways to foster that amongst the parents. I think the, the, the more sense of team that the entire community has, the better and the more active the parents are with teachers, with administrators, with the school, uh, the better off we are. So figuring out ways to encourage parents to come in, say hi, meet us, greet us, uh, share their ideas is, I think, really, really important. You know, there's something about this, and I didn't do all of my own, but some. Um, that this was harder than the faculty mm -hmm. uh, survey. It makes sense. Yeah. yeah, oh, yeah, you yeah. 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 down yeah. what is good and all that. Yeah. Um, I think if we really want to try to get anywhere with it, we probably need to give families some guidance about what good looks like. You know, so you're, you know, like Condra was just making some suggestions, and it, it, I was very disappointed. I mean, I, I found the survey to be almost completely unhelpful in trying to understand the parents, which I, I got something out of, out of the teacher survey, but um, I just didn't. I think the comments are helpful. The questions and the yes. quantification yeah. of the yes. questions is not. Yes. Yeah. Those are the same conversation we had last year. Yeah. It right. is. Because yeah. yeah. we, we, yeah. we made a strategic decision, yeah. which I always support, around you want to keep the same survey year right. over year, so you do year over year results. But it's it's literally the same <laughs> conversation that right. we had last year about that, yeah. those questions about what is what's the right thing. And I know, I know it sounds like a broken record, and I, I own this. I haven't stepped up to, to help this. but. There really is a solution here, which well, is to pick a couple questions that we want, yeah. decide as an organization what success looks like for us, and then that's when we come back questions. to next year. And, say, well, yeah. and so we just have to, and again, I, I personally have not moved on this, so I'm happy to, to be a part of it if that will help, but we just got to pick a couple of these that we want to focus on for the year ahead and pick a success back measure, and then yep. that will give us a bench. Uh, agreed, and, and that was kind of what the homework was. To really, for folks to pick on items that they thought were no, notable. Well, maybe some of those questions could be rephrased instead of passive, how many times, or uh, do you agree or do you disagree? I have two questions such as what would you like to see? What would, what would make you more active as a parent? What kind of programs, what kind of outreach would encourage you? So to kind of put the ball in the parent's court and say, what would you like to see? Give us that feedback. So Sutter, to Mike's point, um, for me, there were probably three questions in the learning behaviors that just sort of stood out that, and boy, if, if we really focused on these three areas, there may be many others too, but these are three areas that I thought was sort of key. One is how motivated is your child to learn the topics covered in the class? 64% responded favorably. How motivated is school climate? How motivating are the classrooms, classroom lessons at your child's school? So when I think of that, I'm like, wow, I would really want my kid to be extremely motivated being in the classroom. And the other one, the last one for me was the school fit. How much of a sense of belonging does your child feel at his or her school? Great. I mean, we talk about this as a family. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I would really want to feel like our kids really feel this is this is home for them. So, those are just some three that stood out for me. Those are good ones. Yeah. So, I got that. I got school fit. But that was my own one. School fit. Um, the other one, I'm, just, I'm not sure about this, so you guys, you guys have more experience with this, but uh, grading bias. Uh, there were comments about the fairness of the evaluation of the children, and the reason I'm kind of putting it out there for consideration is because I'm not really sure <coughs> if that's in response to a specific incident or if it's really a, a pervasive issue that we need to look at. So the, the, the survey question by itself doesn't tell the whole story. And, and I don't know if it's, again, if it's a big deal. It stood out as well. So I guess back to Mike's question. What is, as a board, do we want to see focused on? And, and I think it's a little, I don't know how many folks actually think they're home or not, but based on, on what, so I, I guess I'll ask one of two questions. One. Um, should we revisit this next time with folks having had a chance to look through the details so that we can then come back saying what, what few items. I, I, I concur with the items that you guys had mentioned, but I don't know if everybody's on that same page. So does it make sense revisit this again next time with folks having had a chance to again drill down? And you do have to drill down on this. You can't just look at the numbers at a high level. Uh, and then we can 
use those three or four items as benchmarks for next year. Can I suggest, and maybe this will make the meeting conversation more productive to, for us to submit, our, you know, with our, pick our top four or whatever in advance yep. and try to see the commonality so we can discuss the common okay. Yep. That's actually a good idea. So, so as, a, as, as part of that, so can we make a joint yeah. commitment two weeks yes. in from now? Everybody will mail in. Yeah, you can mail them to me. I'll, I'm happy to collate them. Okay. Um, yep. What you see is three, yes. four, maybe even five <laughs> top items you think should be focused on. And, and uh, what might be interesting is, you know, what's your what's the aspirational target that would be our success, right? So if we come back and we say, geez, we're at 64 percent, I go to 75 percent. Mm -hmm. Naturally, as a place yep. that would feel good to me. So. I think if we could all just kind of pick those items, if you can pick an item, look at what it is today, and then come back with a number that yep. you think feels good, and we can see if it's straight on that. So, and uh, to that point, I think you, again, you, I think you'll have to look at the individual question, yes. because in some cases, it's not that target number. It's like, for example, the one I had mentioned at the beginning, uh, how often do you meet with your, uh, your, your, uh, how do they, uh, with teachers at your school? So. I think the thing that stands out there is where, when, actually this, that's, uh, it was a different question, I'm sorry, but the thing that stood out was the answer was almost never, yeah. for 47% of the population, yeah. almost half. Yeah. And so would you want it to be, at least everybody meets once, you know, or comes to the school once? Yeah, comes to the, at least comes to yeah. the school yeah. once. You right. come to your yeah. parent, you come to yeah. the first night, night curriculum yeah. nights, you can meet the teachers exactly. and see what, you know, what the class is going to be about, yeah. so you know who you're children are going to be with exactly. five days a week. Yeah. Well, I, I guess, that, you know, this, the, the, you know, I'm struck by th this conversation. I mean, what's, what's the outcome we're looking for? Are we looking to try to uh, change parental behaviors, or are we trying to get feedback from families in terms of how satisfied they are? I think it's both, right? One, one aspect is parental satisfaction, or just stakeholder satisfaction, but another is I don't know is if you can change behavior fundamentally, but you can change an environment to facilitate a different behavior, right? If we as a community think, as an example, that it is a good idea for parents to at least once, you know, visit the school or whatever it may be, then you can maybe do various things to facilitate that or encourage that. Well, so then I think that you, we need to be asking other questions to get clarity on why it is that people are choosing to meet zero times or once. I mean, frankly, well, that's yeah, right. So you know, is this because I, I don't think it's worthwhile meeting with the teachers because you know I've heard that this teacher is very difficult, or is it because I think this teacher is fantastic? And in fact, my you know my my kid two years ago had this, and I have absolutely no worries whatsoever, and that's the reason why I feel no need to to to, to go in there. So so that, I think that that second those other questions come after we can come to a conclusion or a determination or consensus of what should be the questions we focus on, and then we can go to the next one. Yeah, I mean I, I think so. I think it's a good next step to follow up, but if we the literature tells us, or our ED and the yeah. administration and people that we respect say, you know, even if you love this teacher, you've had a great experience, we need that communication to happen regardless, then that's an opinion. I, I'm looking forward to that conversation because then we can come back and we can, we can educate, use Mike, or we can educate the world on the value of doing that, try to try to drive that behavior. I love so my wife. Oh, so sorry. we might decide we want to go work <laughs> I love my wife. I talk to her every day. I, I don't think she'd like if I didn't talk to her for a year. <laughs> my experience as a, as a teacher uh, lends me to believe that the more active uh, parents are, the, the better. Uh, and I, I think that's true across the entire school. They may not know. They may not know. Uh, right. That yeah. Level. Right. Yeah. Well, maybe the question should be more communicate with the teachers because this one says meet with. And I know a lot of parents email yeah, mm -hmm. with the teachers. Yeah. So. Sure. And even that just suggests one on one. I mean, I feel like parents night is that really meeting with the teachers because you don't. There's no time to have that individual conversation. Same thing with like the 
thinking back to some of the Europe trip meetings, you know, it's, it's all the parents there, so I'm like, they're seeing me, they're seeing the teachers, but they're not, like, again, having that one-on-one, like, individual conversation about students. So, yeah, I think the wording definitely matters with the question. So, so Rick, so Rick uh, maybe just two more seconds on this. So, do we want feedback from the board on changes to questions? No, or do we want, or, or are you looking for feedback on pick the question and a target, an aspirational target that feels good? Because I think what some folks are saying is that a, a, you know maybe it is time to improve the questions themselves. Or I, I just don't, I don't know yep. if that opens that question. Okay, so uh, I, I would suggest we don't change the questions personally. Um, I, I do understand that the instrument is not perfect. It's far from perfect in the way it reports out, but these are the one of the reasons we went with Panorama was because these are standard questions asked at hundreds of schools around the country with thousands of parents or however many. And so we have something to benchmark against. Um, so I, I would say I think it makes sense to focus on what questions or topics do we want where, where we see numbers that are maybe not so great or that are great and we want to focus on it, pick those. Um, as a result, though, of picking those, we may have more questions to add to clarify you know, or whatever, but I, I think... Yeah, we did add some open-ended questions yeah. to the okay. survey, so maybe what we need to do is change those. Yeah. Depending on what our focus is. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And I think maybe if we make one of our criteria, because I had an aha when it was... It was already mentioned. If, in selecting the five questions, pick <coughs> ones that we understand. <laughs> <laughs> the ones that are hopelessly ambiguous, sure. Yeah. forget about it. Well, so, I, so I, I guess I, I, I got to go back to this this idea of what what are we trying to do here, because the the way the question is, if we leave it unchanged, is you know, do you meet with the teacher? And if I go to a parent and I've met with the teacher, even though I haven't had a substantive conversation, whereas if I have email or phone call conversation, well, that I may not count that in there, and yet that's the substantive interaction that I've had. So maybe that shouldn't be a question. Either. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking well, we always get it's a red herring. Yeah. Yeah. Or, 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 yeah. or, yeah. or use the open-ended questions and they go out. Right. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it possible that we could pick some of the questions and just choose not to ask them anymore because they are yeah. Yeah, we add no value? Can absolutely like remove questions. Are, it's such a red herring, right? We didn't yeah. have this exact same conversation last year. Yeah. So two weeks from today is October 12th. Okay. Say that October we're 12th, emails to Rick. Let's say Friday the 13th. Unless anybody else would like to volunteer to collect the questions. I think Mike did. I'm sorry? I think Mike did. <laughs> Ken is in a mood tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Okay. All right. I will take, if people want to send me their answers, I will. Look at that. Recommendations. Wow. Oh, wow. And okay. I will do that. And Thank I'll, you, Mike. I will Thank you, Mike. Communicate with you. No, send, to Mike. Send them to me. Send I will them collect to them. And then I'll. <laughs> Share them with my partner, Rick, and we'll figure out what to do. Sounds great. Yeah. I mean, we haven't chatted in a long time, so it's a good idea. All right. If you guys could send out a reminder, like on the 10th. I, I will put it in. <laughs> That's probably out. a good idea. Right. All right, so Rick, you will send the reminder? Yes. <laughs> All right. To and send them to you. And when we have three days left, <laughs> yeah. and then we have 15 minutes left. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, we are moving on. I'll put it in my calendar. I think I need instructions on how to clear my cookie. Um. We're moving on to the EV evaluation. Uh, it is the job of the board to evaluate the executive director annually. Um, this was an unusual year, obviously, since we had an acting EV for the remainder of the school year, and because, of course, Dr. Lewis did step in at a very unusual time, uh, at a time of much transition. So um, the, ED, the evaluation task force was me and Rick and Liz, but, of course, we solicited input from um, the wider community uh, as well. We had all board members and all of Dr. Lewis's direct reports, and we really relied very heavily on these June surveys. And let me tell you, this was actually a bear to put together because it was really hard to find things to improve upon. <laughs> it was actually really hard because everyone is so excited and happy <laughs> that they're as much as I asked for constructive feedback, there was very, very, very little given. It was very surprising, because, it, but there was a lot of gushing about um, the, the 
change in morale and just what the leadership, the, the, you know, the, the new direction, and everyone is so happy. Breath of fresh air, right, was the word that was, was a phrase that came up multiple times. But what we did is sort of consolidated all of that information from the um, surveys and, and created this document, right? So we, we did only a tiny bit on the job description, which is how we did the evaluation last year, only because we actually didn't even give Dr. Lewis the job description when I gave him the job. He just, we, we gave him one task, which was to unify the community, and, and he hit that one out of the park, right? I mean, that's so clear from absolutely every stakeholder group. So what I do want to just focus on is just most significant accomplishments and strengths, and then also key areas to focus on for next year. So clearly, the reestablishment of trust in the leadership and improvement of faculty morale was the most important thing that we were looking for, and um, it was just such a substantial improvement. I mean, the trust in leadership from the faculty went from 19% to 85% in you know a matter of months. So that speaks volumes. Um, the other strength that, that was uniformly mentioned was how much Dr. Lewis holds very high standards and, and holds people to excellence. I and mean, these two things, spirit and, and high standards of excellence, are exactly what you, you mentioned now. Uh, and it is very evident that that's permeating the entire community. Um, in terms of how he goes about in his management style, the strengths to know it are clearly very collaborative. And that's something that the board has been looking for for years. So that was very exciting. Um, empowering teams to work together and not having uh, individuals solve problems on their own, but to have collections of individuals with the appropriate expertise and a various composition of different backgrounds um, working on problems. Clearly a very uh, devoted commitment to transparency and open communication. And that's appreciated by everyone. Um, so that that is a wonderful to have that as well. I would say even at the board level, everyone has felt that. Um, but, but two other things that are notable about him personally was that there has clearly been evidence of an ability to make unpopular decisions, right? And uh, he has acted very swiftly and decisively, and that is really one of the hallmarks of true leadership, so that is a delight to see. And also that he accepts responsibilities for mistakes that are made, um, and very quickly, though, identifies how do we fix this so this doesn't happen again. So I'd say those are the most significant uh, things that we um, surfaced from all of the input. Is there any comment or discussion on this? I'm sure you all disagree, right? Because pretty much everyone said the same thing. Especially about the whole thing. <clears throat> no, just this, those, that section so far. The strengths, any comments? Um, in terms of challenges and focus for next year, what bubbled up were um, four things, I would say. Okay. Uh, obviously, it is not his expertise um, it, to know about educational administration, regulations, and compliance matters. So, of course, that is an area that's just an area of growth. Um, however, one uh, comment that we had is while, while we do want him to learn and continually grow in this area, don't focus too much attention on it just because there are people around you, use the appropriate expertise and keep your focus at what is the impact of learning these and what does that, what, what's the impact on the school and how, does, how do you need to prioritize. Um, the second thing would be with uh, his personal strength in collaboration and engagement and transparency, pushing that down throughout the organization and really teaching everyone how to do that because and that's a skill set that is hard to learn if people don't naturally have it. And so there may be additional trainings that are required or whatever it is, but trying to push that all the way through uh, uh, additional light layers at the school so that the entire school can start operating in that manner. Um, the third area would be uh, be vigilant about uncovering what future pain points are going to be. Um, uncovering what future pain points are going to be. Just constantly being on the lookout for what are the issues that are really tiny issues but may surface into much bigger issues in the future, right? I mean, there are ways to look at that. And also to do that in a data-driven way. So 
there is a lot of, um, there has been significant progress being made in keeping the pulse of the school through anecdotal evidence and through a lot of engagement, but also there's data now and there's ways to use the data and, or to think about how to use data and gather it and analyze it so that changes are made in a, hypo in a hypothesis driven way or you can mine the data to see if you can see trends, so that's another area. And then the final area um, of focus should be to begin to establish relationships externally. I mean, that clearly was not a focus in the first year. Mm -hmm. And it, even, even uh, it, it's probably the, the fourth of all of those, but that is a process that needs to uh, continue and uh, broaden. So that's, that was really the summary. Are there any comments on those four areas? Because that's really what I want to come on executive coaching where you're going to get. Okay, well, that was one in there as a. Yeah. <laughs> as um, yeah. So, uh, Anders, I think you do a great job. Absolutely. Everything, I agree, I agree with everything that Pauline and Elizabeth said. Um, I was one of the people who was uh, adamant about the value of long term executive coaching. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, you know, we put coach in place, kind of got you over the hump of that getting just the your arms coach. around the yeah. place. And that's, that's good, but I'm thinking that you should have somebody who is yours ongoing and not, this seems to suggest, like to accelerate growth in gap areas, not so much, at least from my perspective, it's that you come to this with a very unique perspective, which is the value that you add. It's the vision, it's the energy, it's the spirit, the administrative stuff that don't have so much is probably to some degree you'll need to get it, but as Pauline says, to other degree you just need to get other people to do it. But you really need any support that we can give you to keep the mojo going for when the honeymoon ends is something that we want to give you. So that if you're if a bunch of stuff comes up that isn't that doesn't speak to your strengths, that you've got help with that, and that you've got somebody there who is focused on your problems and helping you with your problems and is not paying attention to anything else is a tremendous, you know, we, we, we think of that as, 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 a, as an asset to you and as a, as a gift to you. <coughs> not as a requirement. Yeah, we, we, we give coaches to our top best executives. Mm -hmm. Best ones get that investment. I think it's a great idea. Okay. Sir, yeah. I could use lots uh -huh. of to get it for sure. It is also to identify things that it's, it's, it's written like you, that you're not aware of, right? right. I mean, because uh, there's no question you address everything you're aware of. It's the stuff you're not aware of and that you can't even. They can be right. the eyes in the back of your head. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's the um, that was the final summary. It was a great, very fun process to go through. <laughs> Thank you to the people who worked on this and wrote it. Yeah. Very well done, Dr. All right. Um, we have next on our agenda. We are doing a quick education committee update. Okay. And Liz. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> Excuse me. So, um, the focus of, of this last meeting, and as a matter of fact, we also had started at the end of August was really an in-depth look at um, the test scores and sort of the trends over the last several years. Um, we are going to continue to look at the AP test scores, which is one area that the committee has some concerns with the disparities. And we, we do want to look at what those outcomes were at um, a more in-depth level. But for tonight, what I'd like to talk about, and I did include a pow uh, two PowerPoint slides, is the um, English MCAS results for 2016. And so basically during that time, and, and you can look at the comparison to math at that same time, but the results um, for the student growth percentile um, really slipped during that time in comparison to the to several years before that. Um, the, the overall achievement did go down, which was good news, but certainly the, the slip in the student growth percent, percentile, excuse me, was uh, of concern to us. 
Um, fortunately, Ms. Lindsay and Jessica Hennessy were able to provide some context of some of the challenges that took place during that time, as well as we've looked at the actions that have also been taken. So um, if we look at during that time, the English department lost a significant number of experienced teachers, as well the special education department um, experienced uh, significant staff and administrative turnover, um, which, re which really impacted um, special education supports um, for students on IEPs. So if we look at some of the actions that have been taken to sort of um, address these challenges, obviously we've hired a, a number of new strong English teachers who now have two plus years of experience. So, and um, Dr. Lewis already started to look at this year's results and, and they're certainly trending in the right direction. Um, and as well, the special education department has been revamped, including, including the hiring of the new special education director, a new ELL director. The students went through, a significant number of students went through RETA testing this year, um, which, which is to test English language skills for those who have identified a different language is, is um, spoke in the home and then um, a number of students have been identified who will receive additional um, services as a result. So I think that you know we just want to make sure that we're aware that there has been some changes in that 2016 time frame. Um, we were able to get the context thanks to Ms. Lindsay and, and Jessica in the meeting and we were able to look at what has taken place. So. Um, again, it's more just informational at this point, but it's something we want to keep an eye on. You'll notice at that same time, the math scores did not suffer. So clearly, the students did not have the same challenges on the math side as they did on the English side. So that was something that we was of note to all of us. There are two other things that I want to update the board on, and really we're looking for the board's to gauge the board's interest level and support for these two things. The first is the Ed Committee would like to propose that the board set aside time at a couple of meetings in the coming months so that the department heads can come in and provide updates um, and really provide an overview of what's going on within their departments. Um, this would reinstate a past practice which was popular and useful. And so we'd like to propose 15 to 20 minutes. We'd give the department heads, and we would um, put together, the Ed Committee would put together a template for them to work from so that they can put together a presentation for all of you. Um, so first, the first question is, is this something that would be of interest to all of you? I see one thumbs up, so. Okay, good. So, yeah. so yep. is the goal Love it. Is the goal to just update the board, or does it come in with one or two asks of the board? Well, yeah, th think, you know. that's yeah, that's actually a really good question. That was actually going to be my next question to all of you. What would you be interested in hearing from the department heads? Because that was one thing as I was thinking of coming up with a template. That could definitely be something. If that, they have an ask of the board, we would definitely what I would, I, absolutely. I, my, my, what I put out there is, I love. An update. I think it'd be great to know what we're working on and where we're going. And so we, if they had two requests for the board, what would be the we, two we've requests? talked, Miss Lindsay and I have talked to department heads about this. If they're excited about the opportunity to come in, they're particularly interested in talking about the future, what they want to do in the future, what what they're working on now, certainly, but what they're planning to do in the future uh, to highlight um, uh, some of their goals that they're working on. Uh, I think they're, they're very open to doing that. Okay, so basically what we'll do at the next Ed Committee meeting is sort of come up with that template of, of the topics that we would have them cover. So certainly a, an academic update, um, the asks, possibly one to two asks, uh, what they're doing in the future, what they're doing for innovation, I think it would be great. And, and hopefully this might also um, inspire more parents to um, certainly, I know a lot of parents are watching the, um, the board meetings, but maybe if they know that the department heads are coming in to provide these updates, it might inspire them to actually attend in person as well. So it, it hasn't been a 
regular past practice. The last time it was done, it was done six years ago. Yep. Um, I know because it was the year before I joined the board, and it was the reason that I joined the board, actually. Yeah. Um, but it was great as a parent to come mm -hmm. and see um, yep. over the course of the year to have all this happen. So the one, one thing I'd like to jump in here, the past two times that we've had an ed committee update to the board, um, the, the committee has suggested the board has to devise a way for it to carry out its uh, oversight responsibility relative to uh, faithfulness to the charter and academic program success. And uh, there is a sort of a high level tactical governance aspect to that and then there's sort of the in the weeds more school oriented way that they are that the school is looking at academic program success and so I just would encourage the board to focus on that proper governance role uh, in terms of you know as you're talking about the the academic program to focus on how should the board be evaluating overall the overall uh, uh, success of the academic program as well as faithfulness to the charter certainly organizational viability being the third area it does start to get into the budget uh, budget area but it's those two areas I'd encourage us to look at apropos of that uh, well first a comment on the forward-looking I mm -hmm. think it's also not what are you planning to do what do you want to do because these things are um, there's a history of them being kind of inquisitions and it's you know, and you know, that's not and our intent we have to be very careful to make yep. sure that we're pushing in that direction there was and some concern expressed about that mm -hmm. to me yeah mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yes and so we, we have to bend over backwards to make sure that yep. doesn't happen and then to Ken's point I think it might mean it might be a really good idea if we got a sheet of questions of things we should be thinking about when we're asking what give us a rubric as well sure help keep us on the straight and narrow because it is so easy to get into the weeds mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. if we have some guardrails mixing metaphors like crazy <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <no kidding>. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so uh, as timekeeper I uh, lost track of time yeah, we about right. a, have, have about a minute and a half left on this what one other request is you mentioned about 15 to 20 minutes so let's say it's 20 minutes could we try to make sure that um, there's guidance to the presenter to maybe keep it to 10 minutes yeah. because I, I think we're going to have a lot of yep. questions. Yep. Okay. So, um, so that's that we a good point. Yeah, it's not a 10 minute presentation. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So, Liz, are you hoping it's to like space five this out so one per meeting? Kind of yeah, okay. yeah, we wouldn't want to do all of them at yeah. once. Yeah, that'd be good. Mm -hmm. Liz, we had a similar discussion, I don't know, five or six months ago in governance yeah. yep. around getting closer alignment with the board and um, the leadership as well as the faculty uh, department chairs. So along the lines of sort of the future, one of the types of questions that we sort of batted around was what the department, how the department chair saw the department a year, two years, three years from now, um, how it might look differently from your standpoint. So it might mm -hmm. be nice to just put the thought to a little bit about their vision of how they see the department a couple of years yeah. from now. That's exactly what they want to talk about. Well, that's okay. Great. Yeah. Now, along those same lines, this was something that um, uh, was brought up at the meeting, and again, we're looking to gauge interest, um, but what we discussed was having a trustees day, where trustees and members of the committees could go in and be matched up with teachers in their classes, and it would be an opportunity to meet them and the classes and be introduced, as well as have it an interactive give and take so that um, the board members could actually go in and you know if there's something that they could provide to the classroom um, in terms of, of background and, and the information that that you all have um, and this is something that um, has been done is typically done in private schools but certainly it's something that we would like to explore and see if there is interest amongst the, the board members Okay. So I was just looking up I, in governance. We had talked about this also, and ended up we did have we and we did approve in May a policy on attending school events and school visits. Yeah, 
Um, so this, what you're talking about is slightly different, but I do want to remind everyone yep. that we did, in, in, that policy says that board members are encouraged to visit AMSA and that if they wanted to, just on their own time, because I think it's hard, right, it's not mixing um, topics, but I think it's hard to do a trustee's day just given people's, the board members' schedules to find like one time that really well, works. And Absolutely. I mean, and, and obviously it's hard for the teachers as well. We, right, we recognize that. Yeah. But we thought if we could at least do that as a practice and we set aside the one day and it wouldn't be till five or six months right, out. Right, right, way out. So yeah. it would be way out. We, we talked about maybe January. So that, you know, people could put it on the calendars. If they can't make it, that's fine too. But it would at least give the opportunity to sort of cultivate that practice as being something that is... Um, is a positive activity within the school and and hopefully that would also encourage the one-on-one -on -one visits if you can't attend the trustee day yet yeah, an alternative stuff to that in single day but just say maybe a, a period of time where we bring as many trustees as we can based on their, their right and again we could set it up as sort of you know, this is what we expect it to look like. We all know, you know, things change as you, um, you know, as you get into that sort of setting. I'm sure it could go in, in many different directions. But at least, you know, the teachers would understand what it's meant to be. The trustees would understand what you're there for and, and make it a, a really positive experience. And that's it for the Ed Committee update. So do we want to have other discussions about the, that idea of the trustees day? Is that something that people would want to try? Would it be after, I mean, would it be an evening kind of? No, it would be, be during, uh, it would be during the school during, day. Oh, it would be a school it, day. Yeah. Um, we talked about it. Um, Ms. Lindsay said that's something that she could work on setting up. Uh -huh. And really it would be a matter, and I can send out an email to see, to gauge the initial interest and we can start to put together a date on the calendar. We thought it would be after the holidays though. I mean, I, I think it's worth exploring to see if people are interested. Mm -hmm. I, I am a little skeptical mm -hmm. based on how difficult it is for people during the day. Um, at, Recognizing we're not going to get 100% participation. I'm not sure you're going to get much. Yeah. Like, 25% participation is my concern, right? Because it's very hard to even get people to come for the roundtables uh, quarterly. It's just... Yes. Oh yes, that's right. Yeah, oh, that's early point. December. Yeah, we. That's why we said January. December seventh site visit. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so one thing would be helpful maybe is we could figure out what maybe there's a couple dates. Yep. Right. So there are, there's a January date and a February date or something like that, and you know a couple options or something. Right? That would be. Is there, it would be better if, you know, we signed like a buddy, like 14 teachers signed up and then they get assigned a, yeah, that, a trustee. And that was the thought. It's not like the to, all the trustees would be going to visit one teacher. It's more like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Of um, course, <laughs> Miss <laughs> Cohen. Well, we miss so you sometimes, but if I know if I've got yep. Tom, we can yep. see you and then I can email the Tom and right. say, what's a good day for you? Exactly. Yep. Yeah, that's but that's the one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Right. And that's the whole idea is if we make it a day to start, and we're not saying everybody's going to make it that one day, but at least put the practice in place. Sure. I, I mean, the, the whole idea from governance came out in May, and how many have visited a class since May? Okay, right. Well, you know, I think the, the reason why we haven't, at least for me, is um, I, I don't feel right just, you know, picking up the phones. Yeah, right. like, and that's you know, why if we could no, open it up as a practice. If you'd like me to come, yeah. then mm -hmm. I'll take a day off and yeah. I'll come. But yeah. I would feel awkward saying, yeah. hey, I'm going to show up in your classroom <laughs> today. And, yeah. You know, that's... No, and that's, no, that's why that's the whole idea is to open it up as a practice yeah. and yeah. then start from there and build. Right. I'd yeah. want to do it. Yeah. 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 I okay. think a lot of teachers would be open, but yeah, I think just making it clear like, what the purpose is and yeah. also establishing who wants to have yeah. the purpose to come 
Okay. Who wants well, we, that? Again, we just <laughs> wanted to gauge the interest before we went down further down the path. But it was something that was brought up from another teacher who had done this in a private school. And actually, I think it would be great to have him come in and talk to us about what the program mm -hmm. looked like yeah. and, and how we could structure it yeah, mm -hmm. that appropriately. Would be that would help. Uh, and again, just to point out the PowerPoint that's in your packet for the 2016 MCAS, um, just to to identify where where we saw the issue, it's really in this again student growth percentile. Um, it typically is much further across, just meaning that we're growing year over year, and there was not um, as much growth that particular year. It was much more in the middle, which we hadn't seen in the past. Any questions? Who's a um, uh, pioneer? Uh, it's another charter school. Pioneer charter school. In Massachusetts? Science. Yes. Yeah, these are all Massachusetts. Yeah, these are all Massachusetts schools. Massachusetts schools or Massachusetts, Massachusetts charter schools? Massachusetts charter schools, school, excuse me. Wait, there can't be that many can't be that many, right? I think it's school. All Massachusetts districts. Oh, district, oh, district sorry. Charter schools, district. Okay. Charter schools. Pioneer, I think, is in Western Mass somewhere. Springfield. Sounds about right. Great. Thank you. Do you have anything else? Okay. <coughs> Chris. Great. Take us home. Discussion. Yeah. So, a long way of discussion on development. Yeah. Um, what I'd like to do is run through these slides pretty briefly. So, for maybe about 10 minutes, and then we have 10 minutes to okay. answer the question. Which, um, so, reminding ourselves again of our mission to create an atmosphere of celebration of knowledge where children of all backgrounds and abilities excel in all subjects. I didn't think to put an 18-point type. <laughs> <laughs> uh, empowering them to succeed in the workplace. So I bolded that because that's really, I, I see that as the challenge and what we really need <coughs> philanthropy for. So why do we need philanthropy? And some of you have heard this and we've said it in different places, but to put it in one place, tuitions don't cover costs. That's true of public and independent schools, too. It's not only do, does AMSA ask you for money, public schools ask people for money. And at St. Mark's, where you get in by paying 50 grand a year, they ask you for money, too. Um, charter schools have to fund their own facilities. They don't have access to some of the subsidies that district schools do. So that's something that we're going to experience in the not too distant future. Um, our mission is really ambitious and expensive. That if we're going to provide what's needed so that every child can excel without regard to their backgrounds and abilities. And that's going to be coming up at us, whereas as we're concentrating on our core communities as the original generations of families, of highly motivated, gifted students and families are going, that's going to become more and more important. And so we're going to need excellent faculty, which in a point that Dr. Lewis made last meeting, you don't hire excellent faculty, you grow them. And it takes years, which means to, take the, to grow them over years, you need to keep them over years. And so we have to look at things like salaries, benefits, how we pay for the environment that's going to keep them here. Rigorous and ongoing professional development because of the size of the, um, the, size of the challenge. And it struck me when we were looking at the, um, the faculty surveys that some very large fraction, I believe it was, north of 50 percent, teachers reported that they didn't feel comfortable adapting their styles to the variations that they're facing in front of them. So that's, that, that says to me like we've got to do something like teach universal design to everybody. So these are expensive things that we need to do, ambitious things. We've got facilities, we've got supplemental programs, we have various subsidies for lower income students we talked about a little bit last time around, but again, as we go for students from different backgrounds, we're going to be facing more of that, and we still are facing significant upgrades to our work with PLL and special ed students, so it all takes money. Um, that's why we need funding. How much do we need? That's a good question. So we need to be able to cover our budget, including these increased investments. We need to think about a surplus and what the surplus should be. We've had some discussions of that here. Uh, a rule of thumb is six months. Could be less, could be more. Um, the purpose of the surplus and is that you want money there to deal with emergencies and to take advantage
range of opportunities that are unforeseen. And then you have the emergency, you take advantage of the opportunity, you spend some of the money, and then you backfill it so that your surplus is always there. And so that's also the beauty of you know, unrestricted giving and, uh, and that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to jump in and speak for Tom, even though he's not here, because you know he's going to want that number to be higher as we think about moving into our own facility. Mm -hmm. Because all of a sudden, you know, because you, you, the, the rainy day fund, I mean, we, we you need to repair the roof, you need to repair the roof. Like, yeah. you know, it's just going to come out of nowhere. And so he's going to want that number. To be higher. Uh, and charter schools are allowed to generate as much as 10% of their budget from philanthropy. That's a pretty big number. Where, is, where does that statement come from? I saw it in one of the regulatory documents, and it wasn't stated that way. It was stated that they may. No, it was, yeah. The, the, the maximum that they're allowed to take from philanthropy is 10% of the budget. I, I, I don't know. I've never seen that statement before. I'll have to find it. I mean, something. it is typical. I would say, on the other hand, it is very typical that our we've been able to raise through grants and a combination of grants and donations. We have sometimes reached 10% of our budget. That's a very different statement. A million two? Of your in the early years. In the early years, I think we... But, yeah. but do grants... I, I'm not sure grants count. Right. But that, this was... This oh, one, I was okay. adding grants plus. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So that's so, certainly something that we need to know. When, yeah, I don't... When we're in danger of raising yeah, more we, money yeah, when we're allowed when we, to raise. When we are hit that... <laughs> uh, the great problem to have that we've hit that cap. When we, we have that when problem. We, when we cross that bridge, <laughs> yes. um, where does it come from? It comes from families of students. It comes from alumni eventually. Um, and it comes from individuals and corporations and foundations who have resources whose interests match our value proposition, our course forgiven, and case forgiven. And that's something that we need to um, develop carefully over time. It's different for different people. So, for example, if we're looking at Boston Scientific, our value to Boston Scientific is not coming out of their philanthropic budget. It's coming out of their HR marketing budget. And so our value to them is that we're giving them exposure to, or giving special treatment to people like the senior program management for early talent programs. Um, and then there is a, there's a value proposition in, um, in just in excellence and providing excellence to the you know to the state and excellence for its own sake. And in the past, I think we've gotten kind of hung up. And I learned of another charter school, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes, where that's been an issue too. Is you know like when we went to Boston Scientific, they said, well. What, what's your free lunch number? You know, it's like 2%, 5%. Well, we're not interested in you. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't have a value proposition mm -hmm. for a philanthropic ads. Um, potential roles is that, as a board, some things that we could do, and I'm not recommending them, but many boards have give or get policies. A lot of museums do that. When we were recruiting Mike, that was the first question he asked me. <laughs> well, what's, what's, what's the give or get? Because uh, he was just coming off a, um, you know, assignment where that was that was part of it. So the, where the role where the board has that role, opening doors, creating access, cultivating relationship, acting as ambassadors, not necessarily making the ask, but going with the person who's making the ask. School roles involve some level of professional staffing, managing the data, making sure that we know what the right numbers are, that we're prepared, and so that. You know, um, that somebody working at the school would come to Ev and say, we'd like to, you know, we know that you know this person. We'd like to see if you can arrange a meeting for us with him, if you would go to the meeting. Um, you know, those kinds of roles. So um, because when you said professional staffing, professional staffing of fundraising? Of fundraising. Um, managing data and the execution of fundraising activities. So here where we've been, and that would be a change from how we've been in much of our past where it's not the board of directors that puts on the clown suit and stands in the driveway shaking the can or it goes in the drive. No, we could just keep on the dump tank. Um, but the operations of the fundraising operations need to take place in the school. Um, I'd pay to see somebody out on Route 20. CEO <laughs> 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 Um, uh, you and you and I, Chris, we can go out in the class. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm gonna it's gotta be Route 20 then. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Not Forest Street. Not Forest Street. Street. <laughs> Route 20 it is. Uh, I want to, let's come back to the questions. And then I just want to go over, I found, I actually found a good model school for us, a good big sister. And you did? And, I, and that was the Parker Charter School, which was a lead that Pauline gave me. So they are in, um, and they're a, Parker. they're a charter, not a carter. That's a different business altogether. Um, they're up in, they're up in Devon. And their charter school is based on a distinctive educational philosophy, which she explained to me. I didn't quite understand it. Uh, they have low ELL and special ed populations, as we do. Um, they've had professional development people for 10 years and just moved a year or two ago from half time to full time. Um, and the de development director is very is familiar with AMSA. She is the aunt of Teddy and Alec Boyle. Do any of you old-timers know? Yeah. Yeah. So Teddy Boyle was in the alpha class. Oh, wow. And Alec was two years behind him, I think, or something like that. Um, so Cheryl Lauer, who's the strategic planning consultant, has been the chair of the Parker School Board for the last seven years. She just rolled off. Oh. <laughs> so it's actually one of the reasons that she was very helpful, just that she does it in her professional life, but she's really no charter school. Okay. So it was, but it was very interesting to find a, you know, find somebody like us, you know, instead yeah. of looking at, you know, the charter yeah. schools in Boston, the charter schools that are I know, which is uh, so focused on underprivileged populations. Yeah. It's like, this is, they got a special Urban, educational special, sauce. Yeah. They've got some of the same uh, obstacles to fundraising that we have, um, and they're willing to help. And they have an annual fund. They have as many students as we do, have as many families, and they raise 260 a year. Annual fund, two hundred sixty thousand. <laughs> Compared to us, thirty-two. Thirty-two, right? Um, two hundred sixty thousand with half the number of students. Yeah. How long have they had their ED in place? So they're um, uh, three years. They're, she's been New. three oh, years. The executive director. ED, yeah, yeah, yeah. This development person has been there for seven or eight, and has been full time for the last two. Um, but she would be perfectly willing to uh, to come and spend time with us. And then I would encourage you to try. What was what was what was unable to get a get it projected, but I'll send out the link because they have a slideshow on their website that says "Why Give Money to Us." Oh, oh wow! And it walks through and like we could just change the name, Mr. Finkel. Yeah. Mr. Finkel, with all <laughs> the <laughs> right? <laughs> this were corporate America, we just go hire their fundraising. Patients. I was, I was, yeah. Yeah, that's where I was, Mike. I was like, was can we yeah. poach her? Yeah. yeah. She says she likes us. <laughs> <laughs> Um, happens all the time. So, wow. of these things that I've mentioned, now, now we can go to the questions. Um, are we agreed on, or, or, or which of the above ideas are we, are we agreed on? Where are the questions? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so I wonder how many, how many parents at AMSA had never seen that kind of giving profile. You know, they, they, you know, I mean, when you think about how much over the past several years we've been consumed with sort of surviving as a school and, and a lot of dissatisfaction. And I think it would come as a surprise to most parents at AMSA to learn that Parker uh, you know, gets 260k a year, and I think that would open up a lot of eyes. And when you take a look at what AMSA has in its future in terms of, um, you know, not only trying to work to strengthen its academic program, but also get itself into a home and so forth, I think I think this is a good time to 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 start developing, mm -hmm. you know, that that habit more broadly. So. You know. Well, I like what you've written here. I mean, I think, for example, and, and I, of course, have been familiar with this in a number of years, but that you really identified, like, what AMSA needs sort of above and beyond other schools, like the, the faculty, the professional development facilities. I mean, just to have it bullet point out like that really sort of is, is very striking, I think, for people to say, oh, yeah, that's what it's going for. Because otherwise, you know, I get a fair number of questions because my letter, my name goes out with the annual giving campaign letters. Like, what are you spending this for? 
and why do we need to give you any money? Like, my, my, my child's elementary school doesn't ask me for money. Um, or, you know, I send in a box of crayons, and that's what I contribute. And they don't realize sort of the bigger context. But an explanation like the one I gave yeah. satisfies that. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it no, makes a big difference. It always does. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it always does. I mean, I end up having to explain it every time, and they're all like, oh, now I understand it. Okay, I'll do it. But, but I don't even, I mean, I do it at a really high level. Not This is much better. In fact, as I was reading this, it was like, this was a letter? Why do we need, you know, yeah. good intro, why do we need philanthropy? Yeah. And then you just have it right there. Yeah, it's and really good. And then how much money do we need? You know, and there you got your, you got a great fundraising letter. I I got this. I, I, I think if I were a parent here, I probably wouldn't half the time think the school needs even money. Exactly. I, I know yeah. that exactly. we get the email, but exactly. I just don't think about it. Right. And then just getting a, just something as simple as this is like incredibly powerful. Yeah. Yeah. One of the one of the points that you bring up here is about uh, staff support. Yeah. And I think if you look at finance committee, uh, the ed committee governance. These are all committees that, you know, rely heavily on staff support and, and you probably are feeling as the development committee doesn't have quite that uh, you know, quite that, that support. Not that you haven't gotten support, but sort of more dedicated support. And I think that's probably something that we look actively towards in a strategic, strategic way over the next year or two to work towards um, you know, I guess full, you know, part time initially, but perhaps you know, full time eventually, having somebody to to uh, to, to uh, focus in that area. And I think Anders has already addressed <coughs> that to some degree with the yeah. hire that they're considering. To replace more. But yeah, it's true because you know, you know, to, to have the, well, the one of the issues that we've had is that we didn't add. You know, the person we worked with was great. Really enjoyed her, but you know, like the numbers. Like I came in here and fell on my sword reporting these, this dismal number for this year, and then I hear Tom give the report. He says it's not seventeen thousand; it's thirty thirty-one. It's like, well, you know, we didn't have the, the right, you know, the right numbers, like the right data to begin with, and the execution of all this stuff, like the idea of getting the letter out and making sure it has its points. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure the woman at uh, Parker was probably wondering if a decimal point. Was missing somewhere on thirty-one thousand. Yeah. Oh, she didn't see that. She didn't see that. Well, you know, the equivalent of what this really means for them is that uh, pretty much they're getting about five hundred dollars a year per student. Well, I think there's a question that I have have there is that they're they're total. This is annual giving campaign, not total fundraising. That's correct. I, but I don't know okay. how much of their corporate giving is. But they they've done something and. We should have her in to talk. Well, we are ever talking to the committee, um, where they combine their, their combining capital and operating in their 30 year, 30th year campaign. They're paying for the roof and they're raising operating money. We're going to need to move along because there's a couple things yeah, we yeah. need to get to. Yeah, yeah. three minute warning. <laughs> awesome. Just to and that is goals. I think we can work on over time. Populating the committee is one thing that I think we need to think about. Is that the committee that we had was really a bunch of very nice people, uh, but it was really about the level of a PTO committee. Um, and what we're really looking for are people who are going to know people of means who might be interested in what we're doing, be able to open doors, you know, in corporations, be able to uh, have those relationships or form those relationships. It's also, if we can locate the right kind of people, it's very often in other nonprofits, the development committee is an on ramp to the board. Is that believe it or not, there are people who like asking for money. And, you know, that's, that's the way people are very often getting involved. So we'd be looking for, you know, I think a couple of board a couple of three board members, and then looking for, you know, so a profile of people who can us that kind of access and it would be a process that takes some time and we would also need some support and advice on doing it. Yeah. I mean I don't I know that needs to be done I don't want to do it. Well can this development director help? So <laughs> that's gonna require some investment to it yeah. some consulting. Are, are you envisioning so I I've been on the children's museum so that that development was you know 
gala and a golf tournament and yeah. they, they sign an auction so I mean there's a whole thing there to go out and, and they would build they would do it around the capital campaign or they do I mean there's a whole piece here that if you want to go big then you set up these annual events and things like that. Is that your vision for what where this we need to go to kind of hit those kind of numbers? No. Um, my vision is more in terms of corporate giving and large individual gifts and a minimum of and you know like a, like a golf tournament and again this is just my experience in the United Way. Golf tournaments are very expensive and labor intensive things to do. So are galas. Yeah. You do a lot of work for them and it's just so much nicer just to cash a check. Uh, and you know I think we do I have agree. <laughs> and I think we've got the kind of thing that we can offer where we could do something that was more educationally oriented mm -hmm. it would be a day at the school or that, that kind of an event that was more in tune with what the school does also or have the kids be the ones that put it together whatever the event mm -hmm. be a science fair or more yeah. or yeah. showcasing what the school is about but also this is them doing the work yeah. Yeah. yeah although I think that for many people the chance to commune with fellow golfers is an attractive, attractive thing. That's true. That's true. If we get, and if we get a golfer on the committee, no. Or a celebrity golfer. Well, yeah. So we're we're a in the celebrity period. We're in the process <laughs> of hiring a, a halftime community outreach.
about the letter to the parents? Because the parents are really happy right now, so a letter to this effect might be yeah. well received. Yeah. At this time. I think we need to think about that, and we need to first of all need to get together with the new person because we have we're not like we have to report back to them to the parents about what happened with the money they gave us last year, okay. which we said was to, to the nurse's office. Everyone got a thank you call. I was told I'm not positive that happened, uh, but we need to make sure they get thanked. Some of them did. Yeah, um, no so we got to make sure that the okay. follow up from last year gets done at a staff level. And then this letter would probably go in the spring to kick off. Video, 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 video. Yeah. Chris, I'd be interested in joining you in a, in a meeting. That, Thank you. For meeting with Parker or related to development. Thank you. Would you be interested in having teachers on the development committee? They can reach out if you think. Please begin. Try to peer pressure them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Probably. Again, because we want to think about who it is. It's can't, you know, it's like anybody who's generous and wants to volunteer their time is not really the way to go. Right. You know, having some people who give us authenticity, yes, but in the meantime, like we can, people have access to the, the people that we want. It's a question of where you can find these, the other, the rounding out the team that might be. Is there a short answer to where we have so much money in 13, 14, and then drop off? Uh, that would be for my time, so I don't know. I, can, I, can, I think I can speak to that. Um, I think part of it is, <laughs> it's all my fault. No, um, I think it reflects, part of it reflects the culture and the turmoil that the school had gone through relative, oh, yeah. relative yeah. to that time frame that the uh, parents were happier in the... Well, actually, it's the 49,000 is there. That was the double. That, no, 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 no. That was the year it was a double annual giving campaign. Oh. That was the year we did it in the fall and the spring. For whatever reason, it got switched. And so yeah, that I think was a double, the that double, fall that's one got. It, it was just the, late. It yes. got one of them got delayed, so right. you'll see a lower number for right. twelve and thirteen, and so then we sort of double counted. That, that's and had a oh, okay, had a pretty okay. good year in yeah. thirteen fourteen, <laughs> yeah. and then we had some more turmoil, and yeah. the numbers. Reflect that turmoil. Yeah. So I mean, so it's going to be wonderful. I hope yes. so. The 16, 17 should have been more wonderful, right? <laughs> <laughs> it should have been 260 <laughs> times two because we have twice. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Chris. Okay, with that, I would entertain a motion to go into executive session. So moved. Okay, Ken. Second? I second. Lucy seconds. <clears throat> All in favor? Uh, oh. Aye. Oh, sorry. Oh, roll okay, call vote. We got to do roll call vote. Aye. 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 Okay, and I'm just going to comment that we are going to um, invite uh, Dr. Lewis in with us and um, Lisa O'Connor, who will be joining by telephone. Lisa O'Connor will be joining by telephone, and Tom Verna may be joining by telephone. And actually, Ellen, if you would like to come with us, you are welcome to join us as well. So we will invite you in. Okay.